folks who are here today include myself, um, a representative from planning and scheduling, a representative from data analytics. Um, so they're here if you want to introduce yourselves. Um, uh, my name is Lak Kwan, like a Do Lak, and I am a real scheduling analyst at the CTA. My job is to create trend schedule. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Post. I'm a data scientist at the CTA. I work in the data analytics group, and like I'll be going over in the presentation, our role in our group is to support a lot of our departments and kind of have our arms around all the data at the CTA. And I work in performance management, uh, which works more internally. So we'll first hear from Locke. So good evening, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Locke. My job is to make a change schedule. And uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about how we use data to use data-driven approach to achieve what we try to accomplish. And before getting into too much detail, in general, uh, uh, planning department, our mission is to encourage watershed growth by providing quality service while operating under budget. So uh, there's two perspectives here. There's the service demand perspective and the budget perspective. So very quickly, this is uh, a graph illustrating the relationship between how often we run the train versus the uh, number of customers per rail car. This is an example for the orange line uh, in the AM wash service. Um, so according to our service standard, we don't want our rail car to have more than 80 people at any given time and location. Um, so using watershed data, we, uh, we try to estimate how frequently we need to run the service to avoid, uh, we get into the situation where we have overcrowding represented by the black line on the graph. So from that, we know that uh, to avoid hitting that point, we need to operate at least every eight minutes on the orange line in the AM at the maximum loading point, which is Halstead Station. And currently, it is being scheduled at uh, seven minutes to give ourselves a little buffer and to um, uh, provide a better customer uh, experience. So we have a pretty good idea of what needs to be done using watershed data, but the question is how do we do this and I want to touch upon the budget perspective. So from a service provider perspective, uh, we need two things to provide service. We need manpower and we need equipment. Uh, so in the planning department, we are in charge of estimating how, how many manpower and how many equipment we need for each while. Basically, what we do is efficient uh, resource allocation and in order to solve that puzzle, one of the most important questions we need to uh, study is uh, what we call the cycle time. Um, this is an example for the orange line. The cycle time is defined as running time plus layover time. Running time is how much time it takes for the orange line to go from midway to the loop and from the loop back to midway. That time is approximately 59 and 60 minutes. But in order to make sure that uh, the, the equipment could make the next trip on time, we need a little cushion to absorb the random delay. Uh, we call that layover time. And analyzing a lot of the on-time performance data, we determined that time is about 11 minutes uh, to absorb uh, a lot of the random delay. So altogether, the cycle time for the orange line is 71 minutes. And using the cycle time uh, divided by the intent headway, we can get uh, approximately how many equipment we need to operate the wild reliably. And in this example, it's 71 minutes divided by seven minutes, which is our schedule pattern. So altogether, we need roughly about 11 concerts, in another word, 88 rail cars to operate service reliably. So from this example, it's very easy to conclude, oh, if you want to operate service more reliably, put more time in your schedule. But there is an economic consequence of doing so so if you put seven more minutes into your cycle time, now it's 78 minutes. And 78 divided by seven, now you need 96 rail car, 12 concerts to operate the same level of service. And consequently, the more equipment you use, the more scheduled revenue hours, the more scheduled mileage uh, it will uh, increase as a result of that. And similar to the idea of driving, the more, you, uh, the more mileage you have, 
the more you have to spend on hiring a budget for engineers, budget for uh, check inspection crew, uh, chain repairment. So that will have a significant impact for our operating budget. So for that reason, we need to carefully study the running time um, to reflect on the actual operating condition to provide reliable service while under budget. So a lot of variable will affect running time of slow zones, construction activity, uh, wider shift to wild time. And before we have a lot of good data, we rely uh, a lot on personal experience, but obviously we want to do better than that. And since we have chat occupancy data and signal data, we can transform that data into running time. So this is uh, an internal visualization tool that we use to uh, study running time. So we can renew our schedule every time when uh, something affects our running time. So we can um, have a good estimation of how many equipment. And from there, we determine how uh, many manpower we need for uh, all the way around in the system. And after we renew our schedule, we want to have some level of confidence that this is going to work. Uh, we have an internal simulation tool and we have a server which documents a lot of the historical data such as ridership, real dwell time, how often uh, we have an accident. And using that information, we program that information as parameter into the simulation um, software so that we can run simulation to evaluate different operating scenarios. So the graph uh, on the left is an example of the Brian Lai Sunday schedule. Yeah. Uh, I created two uh, scenario, one scenario for to operate the exact same level of service. The difference is, is one schedule I use nine consoles, nine trains, and the other scenario I use eight consoles. Well, obviously I can save more money by using uh, the schedule with only running eight consoles. Uh, but then uh, it significantly affects the reliability of the service as represented by the pink line. Uh, it is showing the simulate headway, so you can see it fluctuate a lot more than the nine uh, train schedule. So from there, I, from this analysis, I know that I'm really pushing it if I use uh, eight trains for a blind eye Sunday schedule. And we try to repeat this process for uh, all, all the route and uh, for all day type. Uh, every time we renew a schedule. So having good data and um, a simulation tool and, and not using a lot of analysis, we can effectively do resource allocation to make better decisions uh, so that the WOW are getting just enough uh, resources that they need to operate service to ensure that we could operate under budget. And uh, I'm giving back to Vani. So, in addition to what Locke ta just talked about with creating schedule, um, the thing that I'm probably going to talk to more is uh, when you think about the CTA, you usually just think about your riding experience on the bus or the train, but there are actually a lot more um, supporting units that uh, help operation actually um, you know, provide service. So including, uh, including that are, you know, of course, our rail and bus operations units, but also the maintenance units, the infrastructure unit, facilities, safety, HR, you know, and all that. We work with these internal units um, and provide a couple different um, data needs to them. So one is just being able to manage internally, getting a sense of whatever their definition is of liability. Um, the, their use of manpower, et cetera, depending on the department. And then um, because we're working with these different departments, we also serve as a liaison between the two of them. Um, for example, you can think of the relationship between rail maintenance and rail operations or bus maintenance and bus operations, um, as well as interfacing between them and the president's office. So the process that goes into that, there are, um, you know, external, external and internal processes. Um, what you as a public would mainly see are the board measures, um, so we do provide some of the numbers for that. And, um, but internally we usually meet, you know, on a regular basis, usually monthly, with each internal unit, um, go over their metrics. But there's also a daily report that we actually um, put together at, that consists of the entire sort of executive um, managers in each department, as well as the president's office, and they talk about the previous day's service. 
Um, and then those sort of feed into different needs for um, more, maybe longer term projects or more in-depth analysis. So tying this in a little bit to what Locke talked about with creating schedule, once you actually have determined what the right interval is for um, providing service but also within uh, budget constraints, um, you know, you send the train out into the world and or the bus, right, and then various things happen, some of which are in our control and some of which are not. Um, so in our reviews with units, we go over our um, definitions of reliability and we um, take a look historically um, and, and comparatively in other ways um, to see how well we actually hit those goals. Um, so in this example, you know, we're still looking at rail operations and um, the sort of central, uh, sorry, the left graph is taking a look at how well um, from the terminal uh, rail operations was able to adhere to the scheduled interval. Um, so you'll see, of course, it, we're not 100%. So what, uh, what factors went into um, sort of the non-perfect scenario include, you know, um, for, in the rail world, um, delays attribute, attributed to various other departments as well as to transportation, um, as well as actual manpower management. So we look at things like absenteeism, we look at over time, and we discuss that. Um, all right. Um, and then, you know, you'll be, we'll be in these meetings and some issues are discussed over and over and over. So, um, occasionally we will work on other projects as well. Um, because we are um, working in, in the capacity of uh, looking at everyone's data, essentially, uh, we're able to bring together several different sources for more insight. Um, occasionally, uh, we'll have to even design a data collection process so that map there's um, someone in our department had to um, work with our facilities department to actually score stations for cleanliness, for example. Um, and, you know, uh, we've also worked on sort of more exploratory um, uh, solutions for service restoration, which is our term for trying to bring things back to schedule as much as possible. So experimenting with different ways of expressing trains, for example, um, and that's, that's what you see on the right as well. Um, so the, um, these projects, of course, depend, however, on um, the availability da of data. So um, over time, as we've, we, we've had different systems come online, um, we've had better access to data, but also our ability to centralize that data um, and you know, basically look at the same place. And Ryan will be able to talk a little bit more about that. Thank you, Bonnie. So yeah, my name is Brian. I work in data analytics. Uh, my job is Bonnie emails me and says, my boss wants to graph a thing. Do we have it? And I say no. And I say no. And then I say, do we know who has it? And do we know how we can find it? So our role is, from a high level, uh, has like primarily four main components. Negotiating data, stewardship and management, what information is out there about the system? Is it in a data, data silo at another location? Is it with a vendor? You know, what information can we get the, under the hood to like try to get uh, centralized access to? Uh, what are the business needs? You know, at the daily flash report that Bonnie mentioned, the daily meeting of the president and the executives, what are they talking about? What are they interested in? What's the main focus right now? Um, where are, what are metrics that we are not able to provide you know, the full scope of information that people need. What's missing? You know, what dimensions are we not able to drill down to? What, you know, what do we have and what, what types of reports do people like? What, what have they enjoyed so far that we can try to like mimic that type of access? Uh, consolidating data sources. So that's a lot of just raw programming of ETL. We have, you know, uh, I'll talk a little bit more later about the different vendors that we're dealing with in different data sources. But it's also consolidating data sources that are on premises at the CTA. Who's the DBA for this? Who's the DBA for that? When did she leave? Do her scripts still work? Oh my God, why didn't somebody do this earlier? Like that's a lot of just trying to figure out what's where and how we can get it to a place where people have access to it. And then finally, deploying and maintaining tools. So a lot of the visuals and things that people want internally 
do they require special scripting? Do they require a server? Do they require, you know, what's the best way that we can do this, you know, to make sure that it's meeting people's needs and it's automated and it's reliable? Like, what's a way that we can actually make this extensible? So, to that end, we have a couple, I'm not going to say challenges, but we have some main uh, folks that we deal with. So, the first is Ventra. Um, we have the transition in 2013 to the Ventra system uh, was involved moving a lot of where data was located uh, and involved a lot of rearranging of how our processes worked to get control of that data. Obviously, CTA has always owned it and still does own it, but it's now located in a different place. It's now formatted very differently. Uh, it was an entirely new data warehouse built on their end. How do we make sure that our folks are still getting what they expect uh, from a CTA perspective, right? So the needs there are pretty straightforward. We would like to know who is using the buses and trains and how many and how many you know cars we're selling and what types of cars and what's happening, right? We also have a pretty extensive supply chain of parts and management. We have internal you know work orders. We have vendors and folks we work with that do the actual repairs. We have uh, you know paid employees that do that work. We have parts that we're ordering and purchasing through uh, outside, uh, outside companies. Where are those orders at? What's the performance? How much are we paying? Are we, you know, we're, we do not have a very limited budget. Like what, how, how do the prices we are compare, are paying, how does that compare to the, you know, open market? So the, the needs there are to be able to just analyze vendor performance and understand, you know, when contracts come up for bid, what are we looking at? Uh, we also have internal metrics that are not as publicly facing. Uh, we've rolled out, you know, new personnel management um, tools that require, that also contain their own separate data silos of information. How do we, how do we put the pieces together, like Bonnie was saying, about service outages? Like how many of that's coming from absenteeism? How much is that coming from sickness? How much is that coming from, it's the Monday after the Super Bowl? Like, what's happening uh, from these perspectives, right? So this requires, again, a lot of custom by the book, like, we are having problems with service on this line today. What's our absences like today? How do we get the data in a place where we can do that type of analysis quickly? Um, so yeah, priorities here are pretty straightforward. We want to regain you know, the access we had previously to information and have the analytics that we used to across all these different sources, right? And with the TOPS program, the Transit Operations Planning System, our internal HR, a lot of that was, it's a new rollout. How do we make sure we don't disrupt production systems? for you know, things that are crucial for operations people in the field to do their jobs. Okay? So this also means we also have another, you know, we have a, a live control center that is watching and monitoring systems all day. That, that information is crucial when, the, when there's an event, when something happens on a system. Like how do we, that information is being stored and some people have access to it. How do we make sure that's being sent to all the different places that we need to have it sent to, right? So our solution for this, for now, has been a lot of trying to move. The CTA is a big organization. It doesn't you know, change direction super quickly. But moving as much as we can on this to the cloud. Like how can we use, leverage new technologies to make this happen? So to answer a lot of the consolidated data sources, we have Amazon Redshift as a consolidated data warehouse. I mean, this is, this is what we give end users to, like Locke and Bonnie. This is the endpoint where we say, like, Okay, I think I have the thing you need. Can you look and see at this table? Can you make your report off the stuff that we have? Can we build you views on the other things we have to get where we need to go, right? We use Elastic Beanstalk to do our, it's our ETL job manager, basically. Uh, we also host a lot of internal projects uh, on the web servers, things that are hosted internally on our network that folks need to have access to uh, as it goes. We use AWS CodeCommit for our cross-department code repositories, trying to you know, the CTA has a lot of department silos where folks will write a solution for something, they'll have it for 10 years, and they'll be the person that knows how this SQL works, and they know that it gets the thing. But other folks are, in other departments, are running similar queries and have similar analytics needs. How do we make sure that folks are, you know, doing work in the same way? Uh, my department uses Code Pipeline to manage deployments so that we can have an understanding of what resources are being consumed, uh, it allows end users to push those changes to those repositories and update websites, uh, incorporate changes so that we don't need to do a lot of micromanagement uh, on our end of, you know, like, I don't need to know what code Locke is writing or running, but we know that if something goes down 
In the pipeline, it's our responsibility. Uh, for compliance purposes, it allows just general security. We use the virtual private cloud to physically isolate our resources uh, to provide security and keep IT from emailing me all the time. Uh, we use AWS Lambda for pretty much everything else. It's a cheap, it is a very public sector friendly price uh, for uh, the computing that we need to do. We try to run as much of that as we can uh, to keep our costs low. Uh, so with that, I'll invite the other two speakers back up and we can go through questions. All right, who has first question? How hard was it to manage the mayor's request for a non-stop train from the loop to O'Hare? Hmm. I don't want to directly answer that question because it's a different industry. Like, I am Rapid Transit and what the mayor is asking for was high-speed radio, so uh, I'm going to pass on that one. Um, I also want to caveat in terms of explaining we're kind of like the hamsters on the ground, you know, yes. at CTA. Like, um, there are some questions that we can try to answer to the best of our ability, but we probably can't speak to like large capital projects, that sort of thing. Um, so if you want to build a connecting line between blue and red, like that's, I think it's a great idea, but we probably can't like speak to that. So, but yeah. <laughs> Thanks you guys, this is really great. Uh, can you give some background about the relationship with Ventra? and kind of how that works throughout and because i've heard of this thing called a mtn like for third party groups to access that data you have to anyway you can tell me more. I, i'm you. not i'm not familiar with mtn um i started the cta in 2015 uh, after kind of the venture project had been uh in route i know that they were the the cta has an established relationship with them they were the vendor uh, they were the, pr the provider of the like the previous uh, data architecture before the smartless uh, smart card, the contactless smart card system. Um, but from my perspective, I, we meet with developers and engineers from Ventra pretty often to work on you know, data facing issues, how reports are working. Um, I can't really speak to what is publicly available. I know there's a CTA kind of data, like a, a Chicago data portal, and we do release some ridership information publicly, um, but I'm not aware of uh, the other project that you mentioned. I'm sorry. Hi. Uh, again, thanks for the presentation. Uh, just a quick question. What is the relationship, if any, between CTA and, say, Metra or other transit providing services? Does CTA talk to people about how other people are using different ways to get around that are not the CTA? For sure. I can talk to that from a data perspective. I'm not sure about a, a project management or planning perspective. Uh, we meet bi-weekly with uh, engineers from PACE and from Metra to go over what the data situation is and just like what, what issues they're working on in their departments, what issues we're working on uh, in collaboration with folks from Cubic, the parent company that owns Metra. So we, from my perspective, I meet with those folks relatively, weekly, uh, relatively often but they're folks at my pay grade, so like they're folks who are working on the same issues that I'm working on. I don't think I can add much to that. Mm -hmm. well, in a planning perspective, we meet regularly with PACE. Uh, if we have any overlapping service, if we want to be more efficient, then perhaps we should um, you know, um, do the correct resource allocation to make sure that we are not overlapping with each other. So, My question is, Kind of about if you guys could speak a little bit to the pros and cons of uh, being in staff doing this sort of work at the CTA versus what the procurement process is like for outside consultants who work this, with the CTA and if you feel like that uh, <coughs> your efficiency is increased or not by, by working directly for the CTA or if you ever wish that you had easy access to outside and consulting help. I can speak that a little bit. My I don't know if you want me saying this, but my current boss used to be a consultant from, from working on the outside. He's uh, now an employee at the CTA. And when I first came on, like there are a handful of consulting projects that our group at least has interfaced with uh, externally. I think that there, to speak to the pros and cons of the question, I feel like it's nice to have you know, established knowledge and folks at work you know, there every day and are not, you know, like you say, subject to procurement or subject to other things that like the fact that, you know, working in public transit or any public agency as well is, you know, 
subject to external political forces. We've had a change in the president of the CTA within the last few years. And with every election, that stuff is kind of, it's unclear what, you know, organizational change will come in general. So it is nice to, you know, kind of know that as an employee that you have as much firm, you know, kind of rooting as you can have. But I can't speak much else to uh, consultancy, I guess. I have never worked as a consultant, so I don't know. Um, my question is more around the types of data that you have. Um, you mentioned uh, facilities, ridership, etc. Do you also manage surveillance videos and um, large-scale data sets like that and use them for um, predictive modeling and issues like that? So with video data that, um, that is used primarily for security safety purposes, um, we have explored uh, the idea of using um, image, you know, our, our video feed data. It's, uh, there's a time limit on that. You know, there's a window after which they're destroyed. Um, and there's also a lot of access uh, restrictions on that as well. Sometimes we'll use video feed to verify our, you know, like if we're getting track data, but we're not sure on the exact timing of, you know, when a train is entering a station, for example, or if we just need to look, confirm um, with actual observations, we might use video feed. Um, it has its own problems as well. Um, and actually, this is a point where you, you see an additional name on here, um, Matthew Hamilton. He's actually also part of our team. Um, he actually might be able to speak a little bit because he's explored a little bit in terms of uh, image processing, um, if you want to ask him those, those questions. I have a very naive question. Um, so I guess like when I think of CTA, I think of the L and also the bus system. And I just, hello? Uh, I was just wondering, um, do you guys take the bus data into account when you're looking into your um, L system? Is, do you mean ridership? And, okay, yeah, because you know sometimes we'll look at transfer points. Um, it's Often you'll get people working on bus, working on rail, um, but you know, for, for definitely for ridership, they'll take that into account. Um, I don't know if you want to. Well, as an example, we if we see a job for a particular rail station in terms of ridership, uh, sometimes a lot of times it could be due to a bus being rewound to elsewhere. So from that point, we need to make the relationship between bus and rail and how do they, like, the transfer activity, how, how is that being affected by the rewild? So yes, we do take into that into consideration. Um, my, my question is primarily for Bonnie, I guess. Uh, when, you're working, when you're interfacing with different groups, different divisions at the CTA, um, how flexible are they when it comes to implementing any changes that you might suggest or inefficiencies or liabilities that you might identify? That's a great question. Um, it relies entirely on their willingness to implement something um, or to try new things. Um, so yeah, it, it varies widely on management. Does that answer your question? Okay. So you mentioned that there are sometimes ad hoc queries or you know, someone asks a question and then is the data there for it? No, you have to go and track it down and figure out how to answer the question. Um, how do you all go about documenting that or kind of preserving that knowledge so that you can build on that next time or, or learn from that? Um, so I think... Oh. If you want, I, I can. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, a lot of that kind of comes to our group, and we have like kind of internal uh, data dictionaries that we've been working on, and we also we use obviously code commit for like documentation of like this is a query that this person runs to get a thing, but we also try to as much as we can we have share drives that are kind of limited by project of like when you're looking for this thing, this is the queries we've found that work, and these are the people that are like the contacts you should get in touch with to like run that information down. Is that helpful? Well, yeah, but there's a little more detail about how you organize that so that someone who was a youth can come back and find that later. Yeah, for sure. So in, in our case, our, my, my team is quite small. We're five people, and I think that's kind of similar across uh, some departments at least. So a lot of it's just like shared drive documentation and, uh, you know, just trying to keep email, like not necessarily email chains, but just like, trying to have it so if you get to the source of the information, the relevant information you also need is, is present. Can I also 
I also want to, like, the reality is also there is a lot that gets done in his duplicate work, um, or it's stored in a folder, you know, like, how it is. Um, <laughs> there was a time when we were asked for some RTA measures, which usually falls to our department, and I had to go look for it, and I searched everywhere for it, and eventually found it in a subfolder in an Excel document in a separate tab in one of the cells, the query. So we've started a slow process of trying to put things onto you know, some versioning system, co-commit, um, but it's still very, like, everyone kind of has their own way of doing things a little bit. I mean, this is, sure. since we're being honest. <laughs> So as a person who lives off the blue line, I've noticed what seems like an increased density over the past few years, and was wondering if CTA has seen either increased ridership or shifted uh, density of ridership as transit-oriented developments have gone up, and how you have kind of adapted to that. Well, we definitely see any increase of ridership. We do notice that we have a lot more ridership. But the challenge for the blue line is um, we are being restricted by how many uh, equipment we have in the yard. We want to, as much as I like, I love to want a two-minute headway, but we are restricted by the signal system. Uh, and we are restricted by uh, power consumption. Like we don't have enough power to supply the trains. So there are a lot of uh, capacity constraints we have to overcome before we can add more service to the blue line. But that is something that's definitely being looked at. Yeah, I think there was a capacity study done, done on the blue line recently that you could probably find. Um, I think in terms of just general ridership, though, they have seen, of course, you know, a huge climb. Um, I don't know about the most recent year, though. Hello. Um, thanks for the presentation. So you went into a little bit about using data for scheduling. Um, as far as bus performance, are there any CTA projects using data for bus stop location and spacing? If you can talk a little bit about that. What do you mean by spacing? Um, as far as where the bus stop locations are on the block, whether it's mid-block, where it is in location to the intersection, um, and if that has anything to do with increased dwell times or any of the data that you've seen as far as uh, performance. Well, I don't want to speak directly into bus because my specialty is really uh, well. But I do know that they do look into a lot of the uh, dwell time. And like, for example, the, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, I forgot the name of it. Huh? No, it's something else. But, uh, but yes, we do look into a lot of dwell time. And we try to make an improvement based on what we've seen. But as you can imagine, there's a lot of data. and. We don't have enough manpower and analysts to actually analyze data, but we that is something we definitely look into when we try to improve service for a certain route. Yeah, so we um, originally had hoped to have a member of our ridership team here as well, um, but I, I do know that they look at that occasionally, um, but they would be the most suited to answer that question. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming and give a big round of applause.